If the goals of democracy, rule of law, peace, equality, and justice were to be achieved, the judiciary had to be insulated from political or partisan influence. History has records of several countries where the judiciary was excessively politicized and which resulted in a lot of injustices. The judiciary must be impartial and independent arbiter of conflicts. I wish to ask her leadership a very simple but interesting question. Under your watch, what specific mechanism, what specific mechanisms would you put in place to insulate the judiciary of this country from partisan influence so that justice will not be sacrificed on the altar of political expediency. Thank you. Um, I don't know how one can be come up with a, a specific mechanism, but what I can say is that to, to shield the judiciary from external influences. You see, the, the judicial process is supposed to be insulated not only from political influences, but from all forms of influences, period. And so to shield the judiciary from uh, external influences. There are many, many, many interventions. Part of it has to do with even enforcing the code of conduct of judges, because that is grounded in assurance of judicial independence and integrity. Because, and because quality justice, one of the indices of quality justice is independence and integrity. Um, to, to shield the, uh, the, the, the judiciary further from external influences, maybe we need to take a, a second look at even the appointment process. I'm not here ready to make any recommendations, but we do need to. At the very least, we need some sort of procedural guidelines as to what the process is. That at least helps with transparency. That is all that I can say. Thank you. A good legal system must speed up proceedings instead of postponing the hearing date, because it is said that justice delayed is justice denied. Many of our courts in Ghana today do not have judges or magistrates. In some cases, you have one judge assigned to two or three courts. So Friday, you will be in Gosso, next Thursday in, in Tepa, and several other areas. This is creating a lot of inconveniences in the delivery of justice in our country. Would you consider an arrangement akin to the MPP's crutch, MPP's cliche of one district, one factory, so that we can have one court, one judge, or <laughs> one magistrate in this country? <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I believe that um, certainly one district, one court is already in, 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 in place. One district, one court. Yes. It's important to facilitate the courts 
at the district level. Um, you're also concerned about each court having its own judge. As much as possible, that is what it's supposed to be. Um, I do not know what the reasons are currently for there being uh, one judge, two or three courts. Uh, but the, 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 the point is, sometimes it might be out of prudence because of the work, the, the lack of volume of work. There are some parts of the country where the, the volume of uh, litigation is relatively lighter than other places, but there will be distances. So it may be that's how come we have that system. It may interest you to know that in some uh, other countries, they, they do have even what they call mobile courts, where um, the, the, the judge or, and, and the entire court go from place to place to go and administer justice uh, at the, at the uh, deep interior level. And uh, even that is an, another uh, uh, method that one can critically examine. What matters is whether at the end of the day, the beginning of a case in Gosu and its conclusion is, in order, the, the, the time is inordinate. It's not so much whether there was one judge or not, it's a question of how long it takes to complete a case. Uh, uh, that is the, the, the important thing. Thank you. Justice for All program, which was started by your predecessor. Do you have any intention of continuing this project? And what other plans do you have to add up to where your predecessor started from? Thank you. I think the Justice for All program, that's the prison courts. And uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's a best practice, and it's a, a, a method that is being and has been used in many parts of the continent uh, over, the, over the years in not only decongesting the prisons, but also actually bringing justice to their door. Therefore, definitely, if it, it's seen as it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quality, it's a quality method, I, I will, if I am confirmed, I will continue it. Um, adding something else to it, I, I will study what is, how it is being implemented, but it is, uh, some of us, have already been thinking about how by the use of paralegals, one can even bring a higher quality to, to the process and even speed things up. So that instead of the, uh, the, the prison lawyer, who sometimes is not a lawyer, who's the one who draws up the, the, the documents that are used by the judge, the paralegal would be the person who will do that preparatory work so that by the time the, the, the judge comes to that particular prison, the considerations that need to be looked at are there on the paper and matters can move much faster. The, the paralegal, uh, I don't know whether to call it professional or not, because in Ghana we have not legislated on it yet. But it is an area that is, 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 a, is, a, is a real um, booming and a real growing area throughout the, the, the world. It has a, a, an important part of uh, helping to bring relatively more affordable justice to 
to, to people, and particularly in, in criminal justice delivery in, in Malawi, in uh, Uganda, and Kenya. The, the, the paralegals have been very, very key components of their prison justice, or what we call here um, Justice for All program. Thank you. The chairman, the former Chief Justice was very passionate about prison reforms to the extent that under the tenor, courts were established to try to decongest our courts. If, uh, sorry, uh, the prison, sorry. My Lord, if you are giving the Lord, would you consider championing the introduction of non-custodial measures, such as community service, as part of our sentencing policy for petty offenders. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My answer is is uh, is definitely um, prison uh, criminal justice and uh, particularly prison reform is, I believe, at the heart of every judge and. Um, Decongesting, it's, it's not only because of the congested state of, of our prisons, but it is also simply in t for, for, in, in, in the sense for, for the sake of being humane. And uh, as you said, it's a, it's, uh, it also borders on sentencing policy, and sentencing policy also has legislative implications. So it's, it's, an aspect of the matter is also in the court of the of the legislature, because if if the if the um, or if the possibility of non-custodial sentence is enacted, why not? We will be more than happy to implement that. Uh, when you talk to Judges in the uh, in, in the who are in the criminal courts, a lot of them will tell you how sometimes it's painful when you have to sentence somebody because that is the only sentence you can give short of letting the person go. So we everybody is in favour of prison reform and modernizing our uh, sentencing systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In a response to a question posed by my colleague, Honorable Kupoku, on whether my Lord will ensure that we have uh, one justice to one district, So, uh, one judge to one district or one court, I mean to a district court, she said that uh, that is in place. But I'm aware there are a lot of new districts without district court. So at the moment, Bodhi is a district. We don't have a district court. We are still being served by the Draboso District Court. I can also mention of uh, uh, Adabo Krum as a district without a district court being served by Isam Debiso District Court and several uh, others. I want to find out what we will do to ensure that all these districts, we uh, district courts are open and then uh, magistrate or judges are posted there to administer justice. Thank, thank you very much. Um, if if there are courts without judges, we will, or there are districts without courts, that will be looked into, 
and 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 dealt with because every district is supposed to have a court. Um, the the part of the facilitation is also the responsibility of the district assembly. So we will we will go through the necessary steps to make sure that indeed every district is adequately served with uh, 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 with a, a district court because one can envisage that if the when with a, a, a one district one factory it means that there's going to be a lot of um, commercial activity employment activity human a lot more human interaction than would normally be so so it becomes even more important that every district is served that is supposed to be the case and the the the, the judicial service will look into it to make sure that any deficits are, are dealt with but as I said, the facilitation is also very important because wouldn't it be nice if these brand new courts will be courts that are fully techno, fully techno with uh, solar energy and everything. It, they will be cutting edge courts. It's an opportunity and uh, we will pursue it with the requisite authorities. Thank you. So, um, what, what did you say? You are based on boarding. Boarding, boarding will get a, a cutting edge <laughs> court. <laughs> okay. Um, Honorable uh, Amakuhin, yes. Your ladyship, death sentence or penalty, we all know it's a cruel form of punishment, especially an aspect of it that brings to finality, uh, which does not allow a second chance in terms of, in case a new evidence is established. Uh, what could we expect from you in your tenure, uh, an amendment to, because there exists in our law, an amendment, Um, thank you. Um, the death penalty is in our law books, as you've said, and um, the, the judiciary is the adjudicator, not the legislator. So, um, if, 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 if once it's on the, it's on our books, and uh, and sometimes the only penalty for the guilty person in the sentencing policy is death, then the judge doesn't have any option. So the legislators have their work cut out. Thank you. Your ladyship, is our judiciary truly independent in your own estimation? Um, you know, Independence of the judiciary under the Bangalore principles also includes proper financial uh, independence for the judiciary. Because, uh, let's face it, the adage is what? He who pays the piper. I'm not saying that the piper is calling the, 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 the payer of the piper is calling the tune. No, but in, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of seeing uh, quality justice being done, the funding and the financing of the judiciary is, is, a, is of key importance. It's of key importance because um, the, and I'm not even talking about the salaries. I'm talking about the facilitation. That's why I keep using that expression, facilitation. I, they, I think everybody wants to see a well-equipped court. 
and everybody wants to see a well-built court rather than some of the magistrate courts buildings where in the morning you have to sweep, pardon me, sheep droppings and things like that before the court can come to sit. Justice, when you are administering it, has to have a certain cachet as well. And when you're exercising your judicial power in a dirty uh, room, uh, it, it detracts from the, from, from the force and effectiveness of it. So uh, from the magistrate courts all the way through the hierarchy, it is important to address the, 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 the question of proper and adequate facilitation through proper and adequate funding and financing. And this is how you assure independence of the judiciary. Um, does the nominee have any intentions to change the dress code of the Supreme Court judges in particular and other judges? Because anytime they come to parliament, <laughs> we hardly can recognize them. And they are frightening. Does he have any intention to change the dress code to suit the African way of doing things and you still deliver justice? At the moment, as I sit here, I have not uh, formulated any such plan. I have, I think among, among us, over the years, we have not really complained much about our dress code. And um, uh, it's, it's part of the, well, some of us think it's part of the, the, the image. We, we should, it's not a question of us uh, um, generating fear as such. But it is just the differentiation. Differentiation is good. Even in the creation, there was differentiation. Mr. Chairman, my point is that how are you going to Africanize the dress code of the... Um, thank you very much. I, I, I believe that if, uh, at the end of the day, if that is the desire of the African of, uh, of the Ghanaian populace, maybe we will consider it. Um, it is worth thinking about. Um, I do know that in some courts, uh, for example, in, um, in, in Uganda, the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal, their robes have uh, some Joromi design along the, the, the lapel. And in, in fact, it will interest you to know that the first time they, they changed to that, to those robes, it was the, the, the wife of the late, um, uh, a, 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 a Ghanaian judge who was serving on their uh, judiciary, who actually uh, did it on her sewing machine. So we can think about touches, touches that we might bring to our uh, attire. But I'm not sure if, um... please, are you talking about the wig? That's the ceremonial. We, we, don't, we wear it only to come here. <laughs> Thank you very much. But you see, uh, if you want to parliament, you see, uh, Af other African parliaments are beginning to come and look at our, how our speakers, you know, wear their ceremonial dresses. So I believe that if you also do, Ghana is always a pioneer in many things. So consider it favorably. Now, Article 142 of the Constitution and the Court Act 159, 459 make you a member of the regional tribunal. Now, for a long time, I have not heard any judgment from the regional tribunal. Are they working, and why are they not working? 
I, I haven't heard of them also for a long time. <laughs> I do know that um, uh, some years back, quite a number of uh, uh, regional tribunal uh, chairmen be became, well, started working in the High Court because they rank as, as High Court judges. And um, they have, the, 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 the regional tribunals at the moment are not working and um, I'm not sure whether they are not, they are, they are, their absence has in any way derogated from the delivery of justice. Thank you. Um, you know, <clears throat> in the Constitution and the practice that we've had, you are both really? head of the Judicial Service and the General Legal Council. Now, that is why sometimes people mix up decisions that are made at the General Legal Council under your chairmanship, if you become um, the CJ, and the judicial decisions that are taken. Um, will you agree to make you less busy by taking away <laughs> the General Legal Council and giving to a different chair <laughs> in terms of constitutional amendments? I know people, we are all inventing machines to make work lighter for us. But if you are saddled between so many uh, positions, your effectiveness is not felt. Will you consider if there is an amendment to the Constitution to give some aspect to some other person? Honorable member. Honorable Chair, the, the General Legal Council is a statutory body. And uh, under the Legal Profession Act, it, it's spelled out its membership. So if the law is changed, um, uh, that's it. Yes. Um, the, the Judicial Council, that one is also, that was a constitutional one. And uh, it is important because the Judicial Council is the it's, it's, a, it's the advisor of the Chief Justice. I am of the humble view, and you're right, you've said it right, that justice and the independence thereof is also a cash factor. And I've observed over the years that your IGF has nothing to write home about. You are going to be the head of an arm of government and not an appendage of any ministry. What arguments would you put forward to the executive so that they enhance your IGF, which also go a long way to help you run this outfit that you are about to assume? Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Honorable Chair, um, I, I, if I have to mount a strong argument for an increase of the percentage of the retention that we, we, the Judicial Service can keep for its work. There are many types of arguments one can make, but the main argument I will make will be, will stand on the independence of the judiciary. It will also stand on the importance of the judiciary. I've already mentioned it in the development of the nation and the role of the judiciary, even in the security and stability of the nation. And when sometimes, as, as sometimes happens, because there is shortage of cash, um, maybe 
a court doesn't get opened or uh, a court is not well equipped. All these detract and derogate from the ability of the court to deliver in its uh, responsibilities. Because you see, quality justice, apart from also the independence, also has to do with competence. It also has to do with uh, efficiency. Efficiency is also uh, a question of how well resourced you are in the delivery of your work, your tools, and so on and so forth. And in terms of competency, there's the need frequently and regularly to uh, introduce even old judges to new concepts, new laws, new applications, and so on and so forth. There's also the need to orient new judges. So uh, something as important as uh, the Judicial Training Institute, it needs to be something uh, more, 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 more powerful and more visible and more uh, present than it is at the at the moment. It, 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 it would do with it could do with a, a purpose built structure, which it will enable um, residential courses if need be. It, it should also be able to become a, a center of excellence, not only in the West African region, but throughout Africa. It will interest you to know that in, 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 in November 2014, the, the, uh, the African Court on Human and People's Rights initiated a program for, for, for dialogue amongst chief justices. And among the, uh, the, the resolutions that um, were, were passed included the importance of judicial education and the importance of maybe even establishing regional centers to facilitate the, 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 the dream whereby the African Union exists and for that matter the ECOWAS exists. So if we have a, a quality JTI, we would be very well positioned so that apart from uh, helping to enhance the capacity and the uh, competence of, of the judges that we have here, we would also be making uh, the Ghana way of doing things felt in other parts of, of Africa. So yes, uh, that will be my part of my argument for an increase in the in the uh, IGF because with prudent management, it will be possible for us to undertake a lot of our projects with that. Well, let me me that adjudication also means judicial temperament. And with your experience, what would you say has been very irritating to you as a judge by way of the behaviors of lawyers who come before you? And how have you used your temperament to manage lawyers? In the Supreme Court, you see the final result of either the competence or incompetence of lawyers. And sometimes you see cases which, as soon as you start reading it, you see where a lawyer went wrong, never noticed he had gone wrong, never took the right step, just flogged a dead horse all the way to the Supreme Court. And you feel so sorry for the litigant. And uh, uh, yes, I, I think I have given tongue lashing from time to time. And, and uh, nowadays, I have, I have eased a bit on the tongue lashing and have rather resorted to uh, complaining about the person to the, 
uh, General Legal Council because um, all of these sort of um, carelessness, uh, professional carelessness on the part of, of council, uh, apart from destroying somebody's life or livelihood, also uh, tarnish the reputation of a very noble profession. Thank you. So, by your definition, I want to start off from uh, an area that I didn't initially intend to, and it has to do with uh, an answer to a question where you said that everything is politicized in this country. Uh, on that assumption, can one therefore say, or will you agree, that we have political cases, and for that matter, we get political judgments? No, I will not say that. That, that's not the, that it doesn't follow. Politicization is when anything, including whether this special ice is nice or not, be, becomes a matter of political debate. That's politicization. There are cases that are political in scope and content. And then there are some cases that get politicized for no reason. So I don't know what you mean by political judgments. I do not think that any competent judge delivers a political judgment. No, that's not our remit. We are not, we don't, we don't do politics. Thank you. So that has to do with appeals. Um, Statistically, I'm told that appeals take five to eight years to dispose of in, in some cases. Now, how, how are you going to deal with this situation that I, 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 I think is not justice? Thank you. I, I think that every, any appeal that, that are we talking about the life of the case yes. or the appeal itself when it's lodged in the, let's say, the Court of Appeal or it's lodged in the Supreme Court? Then you count about eight years. No, the life or of the, the... the life of the case from the trial right. to the finalization, the finalization of the appeal. Yes. There are many factors that may cause delay. Some people file judgments, uh, file uh, notices of appeal and then go to sleep for a bit, and then uh, after certain uh, uh, motions and so on and so forth, have them reinstated. There are so many factors, but it is possible using the, uh, the rules of procedure to draw optimal timelines for, for, for cases. Um, because there are certain time limits that are established, yes. So it's possible to speed things up, but there are many different factors. Some of them have nothing to do with the, 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 the judicial service or the system, but have to do, you know, for example, somebody's lawyer dies after the litigation. So and basically, so on, we can so do forth. nothing about it. But eight years, one can always do whatever interventions that are possible under the procedural rules to shorten the process. But if the human being, the participants, the parties, slow down the process, then there's nothing that can be done. That is, it's for that reason that there are even time limits for so that you can strike out an appeal, or you can strike out a motion, or you can strike out various things, but... Thank you, yeah. Your Lordship. I'd like okay. to move on to my next question. Now, um, as a journalist at heart, I regret the, imprison, uh, the imprisonment of uh, citizens for free speech, even if it is reckless. 
the, the, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, in a landmark judgment in December 2014, uh, overruled the conviction of a Burkinabe Bukin, uh, uh, journalist, Issa Konati, and uh, ordered uh, Burkina Faso, and by extension other African countries, uh, to amend laws to make it compliant with international standards and treaties by repealing custodial uh, sentences, among others, for free speech. Now, wouldn't you say it is fair to question the court's application of contempt that in recent times have led to custodial sentences for five of our citizens for free speech? even as we have this Issa Konati case, where custodial sentence is not uh, pro promoted. Thank you. Uh, it's important, I, I will not go as far as you want to take me with your question, but I will, with all due respect, Honorable uh, Chair, because I'm not going to justify or not, I'm not going to discuss the 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 sentence in the in that particular case. But uh, taking the um, the Isa Konate case, firstly, the Isa Konate case did not have anything to do with contempt. The, it was fought. It was based on a particular kind of French uh, or let's say civil law. Uh, juris well enactment, but it's apparently quite common in civil law countries to have a crime of insulting. It was defamation. It, it, they call it, it, yeah, but it was insult in the in the um, in the French version. It was more of, an, of insult rather than defamation. We had to really fight. As judges, we had to fight over what was the correct terminology, whether it was insult or it was uh, uh, defamation, because our concept of defamation might be somewhat different from theirs. But in any case, um, contempt is also something which is entirely different. And in, when in the scandalizing of the court, and we come back to that. We come back to that. It was not defaming. They didn't defame anybody. They contemned the court. And that is a specific is a specific power so, so the which argument, is recognized position, even under the constitution. With all respect, with all respect. I am um, with that. Let him conclude, then you take the call. Or if you are satisfied with the answer. Yes, I'm satisfied it. with the answer, and I, I want to just uh, do a quick follow up and see if we get better clarification. Yeah, uh, I mean, so I just want to know if the, uh, the argument or the position is that with contempt, once in the exercise of your, your, your freedom to, to speak, you contempt or I do you, you do something that is considered contempt, contemptuous to the court? Yes, contumacious. Thank you to the court. It means you can, you can, you can, you can suffer custodial sentence for that, and it doesn't matter. I, we, the, the, the international standards that says free expression should not lead to custodial sentence will not be considered. Free expression, even in the international standard, does not mean contaminating the court. It does not mean for that matter even uh, damaging the reputation of other people. If, if, for example, in our separate opinion, we made that quite clear because we felt that some of the areas where they felt the person had defamed or insulted the people, we said there were other alternative crimes, like hate crime, and so on and so forth, that could have been applied. Hate crime in the international sphere is considered a legitimate um, crime, in, in the sense that if you criminalize 
hate speech. There's nothing wrong with that because it's, it's, it lies in the area of sedition and so on and so forth. Uh, so we need to, there are fine lines and uh, I, I don't know, I don't think uh, members want to listen to a lengthy debate on the point. Thank you. Thank you very much. May, um, what new will you bring on board to enhance the image of the judiciary after the ANAS expose, which was a major blunt on the judiciary? Um, when one is dealing with with uh, with corruption, the most important thing is not to be in denial. And when you receive complaints of of corruption, you go through the proper processes to address it. I think part, maybe part of what we need to do is to also put the information out there that really, if you do send in a, a complaint against a judge, you're not going to end up uh, arrested or you're not going to get a, uh, end up uh, being the person who is condemned. The problem from the uh, experience I've had with disciplinary committees. When I was on the uh, Judicial Council, I did uh, chair a couple of disciplinary processes. It was that sometimes, you know, in Ghana, people, in it, maybe the, the judge does something, they didn't like it, they write a complaint, then somebody pacifies them or something, and then they are no longer interested in participating in the, in the, in the work, in the discipline work. That, that is the problem. And then you don't know whether, uh, it, unless they, they backed it with, with uh, documentary evidence or something. You, you don't know whether they were lying or they were not lying, because sometimes people do lie. Thank you. My last question. I want to begin with a discussion from a book I have found very fascinating, uh, authored by Justice Samuel Kofi Databa, Reflections on the Supreme Court of Ghana. Uh, as we do know, the venerable Justice Dateba served on the Supreme Court between 2003 and 2013. And uh, I know that he's here, and I'm sure I have his permission to quote from his book. Um, very, very insightful and illuminating book. From chap chapter 12 of the book, Concluding Reflections, Justice Dateba writes, and I quote, in the first place, it is considered that the Supreme Court should serve in a strategic role as an agglomeration of the nation's most authoritative judicial talent. It is the best forum for the adjudication of substantial questions of law of strategic importance for Ghanaian society. To do this effectively, it should not be burdened with many cases not falling within the category of strategic cases or cases of public importance. This is what optimal management of the Supreme Court's time requires. Thus, the Supreme Court needs to restrain itself from expanding its jurisdiction by interpretation to cover more and more non-strategic cases. Its caseload needs to be limited so that it can be more reflective and be able to concentrate on the leading strategic legal issues affecting national life." Unquote. I want to know your own perspective on this, your view, and if you agree with Justice Databa that we would need to decongest uh, the Supreme Court and allow for the Supreme Court, the justices, to focus on more strategic uh, cases. Um, the, the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is uh, spelled out 
in the uh, Constitution. And uh, as part of its work, practically every case that the Supreme Court does, whether it um, actually utters it or does not, there is a jurisdictional scanning, so to speak, that we do. And, um, and, and if we find that the matter is within our jurisdiction, then we need to, to take it on and, and, and do it. Um, in, in, uh, in Kenya, in their constitution, for the, the jurisdiction of the uh, Supreme Court of Kenya. There, they specify that the matter must be of public importance. But in our case, there's no such uh, qualification put on it. It's simply a question of do we or do we not have jurisdiction? That is the, that's the problem here. And when it's like that, then one has to be careful not to seem to be closing the, the, the doors on uh, claimants who have, uh, who have brought things, something which is within our jurisdiction. That, that, so that's my view of the, of the matter. But there are other procedures that can be used to uh, minimize the, 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 the time spent on, on, on some of the cases. Uh, there's a procedure that is in the uh, Courts Act for, for enabling the, the handling of certain types of motions and, and cases without actually sitting on it. These are some of the things one can examine because in some courts, they, they, if, if they determine, they predetermine issues, certain issues like jurisdiction, capacity, and so on and so forth, without even court appearance, because if there's no jurisdiction, there's no jurisdiction. If there's no capacity, there's no capacity, and it's dealt with, and you are notified, and, and that's all there is to it, yes. So there's room for examination on how uh, we can reduce caseload. Thank you. The, the, the other area, my lord, Justice that argues is in need of reform has to do with presidential election petitions. He argues that the Chief Justice who chairs the Rules of Court Committee should take a second look, the Rules of Court Committee should take a second look at streamlining the civil procedure rules governing presidential elections according to Article 157 of the Constitution. It is his contention that the last presidential election petition in 2013 took a considerable length of time, uh, which uh, uh, really was not the best. Uh, do you share that view, and can we expect that if given the nod by the Parliament of Ghana, you will uh, take a look at this uh, proposal as uh, espoused by Justice Dateba. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, actually we, we have already done so. We have already done so. We did, we did so, I think the enactment must be, the, the, the LI must be dated uh, December or November because we, we worked on the on, the, on optimizing the, the timelines because, you know, there's a built-in time wastage which arises from the Constitution itself, which we decided until there's an amendment, there's nothing we can do about it. But working around that, we then optimized the time. 